webinar, but we have a special discount this week, um, which you'll see loads of from the new year. <laughs> um, Vanessa Graber, she's joining us as a data science um, academic hire for yeah, starting in semester B. So she'll be around then, but she just wanted to come here, I guess, and see what the place was like so she could still like maybe not be calm if she didn't find a little yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm that kidding. Was not more to kind of get organized and yeah. yeah I'm just joking. <laughs> um so um yeah, so she's a theoretical astrophysicist with an expertise in um neutron stars. So I think that's what she's gonna be talking to us today about. If anybody attended the the interview talks, um you probably got a little snapshot of what she does, but this will be a little bit more um yeah, about what you do. Okay. Um and you're currently in Spain at the Institute for Space Sciences. Um, yeah, so moving overseas rather. Soon. I mean, coming back, I did my PhD in the UK, so yeah, and it's too hot in Spain. I'm one of those weird people that oh, find it too hot, hot in Barcelona. Well, <laughs> see, saying that in England about this time of year, I don't know. I mean, I was, I was, I was so happy when it actually rained because I haven't been raining in like I think seven weeks. I'm yeah. not lying, so oh, no. <laughs> all right, okay. Um, I work on quite a lot of different topics on Newton stars and I'm going to pick the more data science focused one um, because I think there might be some interest here on that. Um, you might probably hear me at some point in the future talk a little bit more about the other things that I also do which is a bit more condensed matter nuclear physics inside Newton stars um, but I decided to go with a more digestible topic for, for this presentation. Um, so specifically I'm going to talk about something that I've been working on at the Institute of Space Sciences in the last sort of three and a half four years with two of my PhD students and my boss, and Andrea, who some of you might know. Um, and it focuses on using machine learning to do pulsar population synthesis. So let me tell you a little bit more about what that means. So um, what are Newton stars? Because there aren't that many Newton star people um, here. I just thought I'd give you a bit of an overview. So Newton stars are one type of compact object that is created during the final stages of stellar evolution. Specifically, when we have a star that has between on the order of 8 to 25 solar masses and they run out of their fuel, they essentially collapse under their own gravitational attraction. Um, and the resulting process of this inward motion and the outward bounce is this supernova explosion that we see um, quite a lot of. Um, and people have sort of modeled as these turbulent uh, processes in 3D hydro simulations and looks on something like this. Well, behind is a very compact object there that the center at the end that you can't see here. But during this process, um, we have what's referred to as electron capture processes. So we um, merge a proton and an electron produce a lot of neutrinos and neutrons. That's where the name comes from. Um, okay, so we produce a lot of neutrons. This is where the name essentially is coming from. Very creative uh, in the naming here. And what is left behind is an object that has between one and two solar masses, radii around nine to 15 kilometers. And if you look at these two numbers together, you get densities that are on the order of 10 to the 15 grams per cubic centimeter. So this is denser than the atomic nuclei that we have on Earth. So we don't really know exactly what's going on at these high densities, which is a really big open problem in this field. But this is essentially what I work on a lot um, otherwise. So I'm not going to go into detail here, but focus just on the fact that these objects exist and we want to better understand their properties. So how can we observe them? How do we know that they're actually present? So Newton stars don't just have these really high densities, but they also unite a lot of other extremes of physics. Specifically, they have really strong magnetic fields on the order of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 15, 16 Gauss. Just for comparison, the Earth's magnetic field is about half a Gauss, so it's much higher. And they also have really fast rotators. And because of the fact that the rotation, the magnetic axis are actually misaligned, these neutron stars emit what we refer to as lighthouse radiation because they have these radiation beams in the radio that if they sweep over the Earth, and we're lucky to have a telescope, a radio telescope underneath, you essentially see this increase in flux at a very regular period, and we can detect these rotations that come from the star. So because of this very regular um, process, we refer to these neutron stars that we see like this also as pulsars, and this is how Jocelyn Delbrunel actually detected them for the first time um, during her PhD with this radio telescope that you see there in the background. So I just said that we can time, I mean, we call this timing, that we can really like precisely measure these um, clock-like radio pulses. 
And for some of quite a few of those, we actually know those arrival times that well that we can not only just measure the, the period itself, but also the period derivative. And at the moment, we know around like 3,000 uh, 3, pulsars across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, so no longer just in radio, but also in gamma and in the X-rays. And what we like to do is plot them on this PP dot diagram where we have the period derivative on the y-axis and the period on the x-axis. And I've colored them here according to um, a relatively phenomenological way of just grouping them according to the properties that we see. So you see the very high um, magnetic neutron stars up here. Those are the blue squares. Those are what we refer to as magnetars. And you have those that are relatively uh, fast rotators that are very, very old and very often have a binary um, companion associated with them because we think that those are the ones that have been recycled um, from accretion and then reached those high periods. So we have these kind of like objects in this, this plane and we use this really as a diagnostic tool to understand what these neutrons are doing. So specifically, um, the largest class, and that's the, also the way, I mean, we detected them in the radio first, so we've just been taking a lot of data in that area. So the largest class is what we refer to as the isolated radio pulsar population that you can see here. So it's sort of like the main bulk of this population. Well, we have about 1,000 objects in total. And if I want to look at like a population level study, obviously we want to take um, the largest sample that we have to sort of like start building um, our models. So how does population synthesis work in this case? Um, and why do we actually need this? So if we look at like the total number of neutron stars in our galaxy, we can get an estimate for that by looking at the core collapse supernova rate, which is about two per century, and the age of the galaxy, which is about 13.6 billion years. And if we just multiply those two numbers with each other, we find that we have on the order of like 10 to the eight to 10 to the nine neutron stars in the galaxy. Okay. I just told you we see only 3000, which is like many, many, many orders of magnitude difference. So the question is, can we like, try and bridge the gap between these two, two scales and use a kind of process to like really uncover more about this entire population? And the answer is yes. So this is where like pulsar population synthesis comes in. And I mean, population synthesis in that form is something that we do in lots of fields in astronomy. Um, and this is something that has been done for quite a long time. And people have already started doing this when pulsars were first discovered and people only had like 50 or 60 objects. But the more we have, the better this is. And we're kind of like um, awaiting like quite a bit of a revolution in that sense that we expect this number here to grow quite a lot because SKA is about to um, detect a lot more data. Um, so we kind of like need the tools ready to actually deal with larger data and actually take advantage of that data that we have. So what does our workflow look like? So we model the birth properties, um, assuming that we understand the physical prescription relatively well at this end. And we use a Monte Carlo approach. So we sample from our parameters that we have. We evolve those forward in time according to some prescription. And I will show you some in a bit. Um, at which stage we have this full evolved 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 um, neutron star population in our galaxy. And we apply some filters that mimic our observational biases and limitation. So we sample down to the 3,000, well, like the 1,000 that we observe. And then we compare those mock simulations, those several thousands that we've run to the observations, to the single universe that we have to actually try and figure out which is the right one that we put in here. Okay, so this is our like workflow in this full picture. And to do that, um, this is like the, the main motivation is really like that Newton stars are sort of like at the, the center of lots of like phenomena in astrophysics. Um, so understanding their natal properties, their birth rates and sort of their evolution well is really like an input to lots of other fields of uh, physics. So for example, they are like the endpoints of mass and stellar evolution. So obviously like that provides information as like the end point of what you've put in, in that sense. They also like at the center of gamma ray bursts as radio bursts and very, very bright, peculiar supernovas. So they sort of like um, really like to try and understand these processes relatively well and get rates right. You really need to understand the properties of these different neutron star classes. And then another thing that is kind of important for us is, I said earlier that the core collapse supernova rate is about two, but if we look at like these individual classes together, um, we basically don't make enough neutron stars via core collapse supernova to actually make all these classes individually. We would need way too many. You just see this here. These are like four types of these different neutron star classes. 
those are the magnetized, those are the um, really strongly magnetic ones. Um, and if we wanted to make these all together, we really would need like something that's quite a bit larger than what we see. So what people have suggested is that there is like actually evolutionary links between those, but to really like constrain those properly and really motivate this, we need to understand the individual birth properties and the individual like birth rates for these individual classes very well. So that's another motivator. Um, so how do we do this? Um, so we start by like focusing on two parts of the problem that are disconnected. So there's the dynamics and then there's the properties that actually control the emission of the star. And for the dynamics, we assume that neutron stars are born in star forming regions in our galaxy. So we basically make them in the galactic disk along the spiral arms. Um, and on top of that, during these explosive supernova processes, they also get what we call a birth kick. So they actually get accelerated quite a lot. And those are the two components that we really have to put in. So we make some assumptions on how this works. So we make an assumption for a spiral arm model in the galaxy and assume that the galaxy rotates with a certain uh, fixed rotation period. We assume that we have a disk, like a galactic disk, which is exponential. And the parameter that we control here is the scale height. So that just depends or controls how puffy the disk is. Um, so we just have a functional form for the PDF that looks like this. We also make an assumption on what the Maxwell kick velocity distribution looks like. Um, so this comes out of observations of, of from other people that have analyzed the observed sample of pulses that we have. And this fits the, the data to date relatively well. And there we also have another free parameter that is this dispersion, sigma k. And on top of that, we have a galactic potential. So in the dynamics, we can primarily vary these two parameters for our Monte Carlo approach to then sort of like figure out how puffy this galaxy is and how um, quickly the stars move away from their birth properties. What this essentially boils down to is solving the Newtonian equation of, of motion for our galactic potential in cylindrical coordinates. And I'm just going to show you some um, two little movies that show you how this works. So this is the top view of the galaxy. This little dot is the, the sun. The zero zero is the galactic center. And you sort of see that we make these neutron stars and we just plot their tracks as they move in time. And you see that some are a little bit faster, like this one's relatively quick, and others are a little bit slower. And that is really controlled by the kick that they get at birth. And um, this is the side view. So you, for example, see again, they start in the disk and they move away. And this one is, for example, also one that's relatively quick um, and is actually going to escape the galactic potential in this case. So for the population synthesis, what we need in the end um, are not these tracks, but we essentially like just look at the endpoints of them because the endpoints of these tracks are like the population of the neutral stars we have currently in our galaxy. And that's what we want to compare to. Um, the second ingredient, yes. Do you mind any questions? Have you... No, 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 go ahead, please. Well, I was just wondering if neutral stars in the process, in other words, are launched with the escape velocity. Um, is there any evidence for those? Yeah, so being observed, and um, there is like a few that like have been detected in the halo, but it's not exactly clear um, if they were ones like the very few ones that are born actually a little bit further away, mm -hmm. or if they were actually like those that have been um, accelerated um, sufficiently. So. Measuring proper motions of pulsars is relatively tough because we have to do this via pulsar timing. So you need quite a lot of observations to actually do that. But then the problem is also, you, you don't know the line of sight velocity. So you only have a projection on the sky. Mm -hmm. So actually measuring 3D velocities is relatively difficult. So um, the answer is we see a few up here, but we do know for some of them, they actually have velocities that are on the order of a thousand kilometer per second. So they are very fast. So they will definitely be able to escape. But I should also say we only have measurements of actual proper motions, I think, over 216 of those thousands of pulsars. So there's the sample is relatively small. Okay. okay, so the second ingredient is the magnetorotational evolution. So um, the Newton stars uh, have a magnetosphere that exerts a torque onto the star. And this torque essentially causes the star to spin down. And it also causes an um, alignment of this magnetic and rotation axis picture that I showed you earlier so that you can see here. So um, this axis will move on a population scale towards the rotation axis. Um, and the magnetic field evolution we now know in this Newton star interior 
is driven by like a range of physical processes that um, are referred to as the Hall effect and omic dissipation, specifically in the outer Newton star layer, which we call the crust. And we again have to make some assumptions on how we can model those properties. So in our Monte Carlo approach, we make an assumption of what the initial periods are distributed like, and we assume a log normal, again, because this is something that other people have found from their observation. The initial magnetic fields have also um, a log normal distributions with two free parameters, just the same functional form, but with a B here. And then we have a final fifth parameter um, that describes that the field actually decays on longer timescales than 10 to the six years, um, which is what we assumed is a power law distribution that has this power law index alpha. So this picture, we have five parameters um, that we can vary. And um, what we do then to evolve them forward in time again is solve a set of differential equations that someone else has given us. Um, and we also use um, some of the simulations from some other people in our group that do um, 2D and 3D magnetothermal simulations that actually give you the magnetic field as a function of time. And we put that in. We need these essentially to obtain tracks like this. So this is the observed PP dot that I have up here. But I can make a similar video that I showed you for the dynamics, also for um, the this evolution in the PV dot diagram. So Newton's are born on the top left, um, and as they evolve forward in time, they first follow these like lines of constant magnetic field that, that you can see here. And once the field decays, they start to bend down. Okay, so this is the the third or the second evolutionary picture that we essentially have. And once we've evolved them forward in time, we can follow their end positions and take a snapshot of this and try and see which one matches the best to the one that we observe. Okay, the, the next thing that we need to add is also like um, a piece of physics that actually tells us, well, how bright are these? What's the flux of these sources that we observe on Earth? So we have to make an assumption on what the radio emission looks like. So we assume that this emission is powered by the um, essentially by the rotational energy that these stars ha have. So they're quite um, uh, compact objects. They rot re rotate relatively fast. So it is quite a large um, angular momentum reservoir. So we tap into this and convert this in, with some proportionality factor into um, a radial luminosity. Um, and we use a functional form that looks like this. And we again take some of this um, from uh, observations, basically this, this three factor here, to sort of like try and um, find out what the proportionality constant here is. On top of that, I showed you earlier this lighthouse radiation, so the emission is actually beamed. So because of this beaming and a certain opening angle, if you have this beam not sweep over you, you actually can lose quite a lot. Um, and from what we think this beaming looks like from those that we observe, we actually do lose about 90% of the pulses just because of geometric effects, essentially. And for the ones that do intercept our line of sight, we then compute the radio flux. Um, given by this expression, where d is the distance and omega the solid angle that they spread out and the pulse width. And we essentially then use an equation um, that someone that has a radio telescope has fitted to their observations and said, well, if you have a certain flux from a certain source and it goes above a specific threshold, we detect this. So for us, it's literally just saying we have an equation. We know exactly in a certain direction of the sky what the limit is and if our model source or fake pulsar is above this, we count this as detected. And we have these parameters for three specific surveys that were done with Muriang, the Parkes Radio Telescope. Um, they have detected between 1,000 and 218 pulsars. They're all isolated again. Um, and you see here that they cover a slightly different range of um, galactic longitude and latitude. We probe slightly all the Newton stars with this window and park multi beam so which is the blue dots, because they have actually moved away, which is the question that you just had. So there is some that have moved a little bit further up. Um, and what this looks like in this PP dot plane is like this. And now we ask the question, can we actually constrain these birth properties by looking at this current snapshot of the pulsar population? Okay, so we have to kind of like, from this picture, like go back and figure out what happens at birth. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, and this is where machine learning, specifically this simulation-based inference um, picture comes in. So we have this question that we want to compare our observations with models to constrain the regions of the parameter space that are actually most probable given the data, which is really like a fundamental question that we have throughout lots of different scientific disciplines. 
And specifically in pulsar population synthesis, because we have this really complex simulation frameworks, because there's a lots of different knobs that we can twist. And I mean, I basically told you that we would mainly vary five for this magneto rotational one, but there's a lot of assumptions that we make. It's really tough to actually do this comparison properly. And really like the first, I would say 30 years, people did what you would do. You would just like simulate something by eye. You look at the outcome, you vary some of the knobs by hand and you just look how, how close can you get to what you observe. And people did that for quite a while. I mean, this paper is from 2007. So this is still something that people do quite regularly if they're developing new kinds of like models to just see how can they do this. People have also used relatively simple KS and chi squared tests. Obviously we know that these fail in certain areas. People have used annealing methods to find optimize it, the optimized parameter space. Um, and also there's one paper where they've tried um, to use a Bayesian approach, but they've had to really make some significant assumptions of what the likelihood looks like. And they also had to use a much more simplified version of the simulator than, than I just showed you before. And obviously that means that you're losing information again. Um, so they're difficult to, to use with these multidimensional simulators. And they also really don't scale very well if you want to add more physics. So this is where deep learning comes in. Um, I'm going to just quickly go through this. So deep learning is the subfield of artificial intelligence and machine learning um, that focuses on using these multi-layered neural networks, where essentially it's just a mathematical framework to learn um, nonlinear relationships from, from higher dimensional data. Okay. So the, the cool thing about machine learning in, in the framework of deep learning is that I don't have this like um, significant uh, step that requires a lot of what's referred to as domain knowledge that you see illustrated here, where this is intermediate person that knows a lot about the field essentially has to figure out how to compress the data so that the algorithm can learn something from it and is to extract these features. So the idea with deep learning is that you can actually have these neural networks try and figure out themselves what the best kind of information is that they want to put in. So this implies that we are having a framework that recognizes these features in a hierarchical way. Um, and where this really works best is if you have large data sets of unstructured data, which is a huge number of like words and text or specifically images where you can easily like, if you count individual pixels, because each, each pixel is essentially a value that you put in, you exceed several millions with a simple image relatively quickly. So specifically we've used convolutional neural networks, um, but just to show you again, the simple relatively straightforward um, neural network where I have an input layer, an output layer and a hidden layer in the middle. And you see that there's these black arrows. And in this specific case, I have connected all these nodes with each other. So if you look at this one, it receives some information from each of these input layers in the first one. This one also receives information from each of these three in the first one. And if I look at the output, you have four um, errors that arrive here because you have essentially information transported across from all of these nodes in the hidden layer. So in this specific case, um, in this specific stack experiment that I've shown you here, we have what's called a fully connected neural network or a multi-layer perceptron um, in analogy with how this works in our own brains. Um, and for some of the first studies we did when I started like, trying to figure out how neural network really work, um, this, is, this is what we use, just the, the most simplest case that we can do. But the more complex your problems get, you do realize relatively quickly that it's kind of like tough to train these because essentially like each of these black errors is essentially like a free parameter that you have to train. So these kind of structures are not that straightforward to actually train and optimize properly. So people have come up with um, a modified version of this, let's say, where um, I don't actually have all of these connections present, but only some of these are activated in this chain, which is what we refer to as um, a convolutional neural network. And you have a lot more flexibility in having kind of neural networks that are structured like this, where you remove some of these trainable parameters in yet. And you have, um, you share sort of like information between these different nodes that you have across your um, neural network. Um, two of the main things that we have in these um, CNN. So if you've ever seen 
people have these flowcharts of what's like happening in their neural network. So there's two main blocks that we essentially use. One of them is a convolutional filter, and the other one is referred to as a max pooling layer. Um, and I've just put two examples here. In this idea of like recognizing more and more complex features, this convolutional filter is essentially responsible for extracting certain types of information. So for this specific one here, this is essentially recognizing the edges of this image here on the left-hand side. Um, and what you're trying to do in your neural network is to actually find the, the filters for the numbers that best match your um, output given a certain type of input. And the other thing that we, we use to make this training better is what's referred to as max pooling layers, where essentially, if you look at this, oh, what is this, 14, uh, four times four, so the 16 numbers that you have here, you um, separate this into individual blocks. And in this little top left corner, you just look at the largest number that you have. So you use the maximum value that you get. So you take the eight across, which essentially like is another way of saying you use the largest signal in your, in your image or in your input. And you then only continue working with this because that's a sufficient amount of information to actually propagate across. And obviously, if you reduce the number of uh, inputs that you have, you also speed up your training process. So this is something that's really useful if you want to optimize your, your learning. So in the first um, study that we looked at in 2021, we just focused on the dynamics and we produced this relatively large um, database of 16,000 synthetic neutron star populations. So this is one of the snapshots that I showed you earlier. And we essentially varied the scale height and the dispersion. So those two parameters are like two things that control how, how spread out our neutron stars are. And we have to do one special thing um, because this kind of picture that I showed you here is not something that the neural network can work with. It's basically just like tracks in this sense, but what we care about is the end positions. So we have to um, provide the neural network with um, a representation of this. And we specifically looked at like making density maps and we looked at different um, representations of this. So you can do this in galactocentric coordinates, but we realized what actually works better is if we use this ICRS representation where we have the declination and the right ascension in these pictures. And this is the actual I mean, the galactic um, disk. You see the stream here in that picture. So the galactic center is right there. It's where like, it gets really red. Um, so this is just the position of the Newton stars in our simulations. And these are the, um, the proper motion. So this is um, the two proper motion maps that we get for our stars in this picture. And then we essentially set these images. Um, so three times 16,384 into our neural network pipeline. And we essentially trained a neural network from these images to recover the two parameters that we put in. So this dispersion parameter and the scale height. And this is, I mean, this is the neural network that we use. We implemented this in PyTorch and it's a relatively simple neural network in the sense that it has two main blocks where we have a convolutional layer and a max pooling layer here, and then another convolutional layer and a max pooling layer. And we flatten the output. And these are the two numbers that we want to predict. And we did find that this is actually relatively straightforward to do. Um, just some parameters and to sort of like visualize this, um, I'm plotting here the relative error between the target and the predicted labels. So this is the target label, so T index is the target. Uh, and this is the prediction minus target divided by the target. And you see sort of like um, at very low values of this, the maps by I, if you look at them, they actually look relatively similar. So this is also where the network has a harder time to recover the actual differences between those different maps. Um, but on average, the relative error that we get is on the order of like 10 to the minus one to 10 to the minus two for these parameters. And if you look at the values at these, um, I just picked two. Um, if you use a scale height of 0.18 kiloparsec, this mean error that you get is on the order of 0 0.01 kiloparsec. Now you see that there's um, the picture that I showed you before, there's one catch in here because I said earlier that we observe about a thousand, but this is the full population in this picture. So what we did here is essentially just like make the assumption that there is no observational biases um, just to sort of like test if, if this works. And we did implement observational biases in a relatively simplified way um, by because we don't actually know um, how these um, uh, 
because I said earlier, we only observed 216, and that's relatively little to really scale down from the like a million to the 216. So we don't know very well how those observational biases are actually present. So we fitted a relatively simple functional form to this, but for the 216 that we observed, there's really no chance that you can constrain this with even remotely this kind of like um, precision. Um, we did predict if we see about a factor 10 more with SKA, you get closer to this kind of like region, but you also need to know these velocities relatively well. So this is one of the things that really motivates to do these kind of really accurate characterizations of neutron stars with future telescopes like SKA. But it was also for promising and it basically was for us to learn how to do first of all population synthesis develop a new code and also learn how to do machine learning at the same time okay so for this kind of picture that i just showed you here we didn't use a statistical inference approach we just tried to predict the actual value that we put in so we tried to derive point estimates but for most of the things that we do in astronomy also in physics we don't actually need to know exactly what value it is, but we kind of want to narrow down parameter regions that are most likely. So we want to do, in principle, what Bayesian inference does. Um, the problem is, how do we do this in this picture? So just to recap what that really means is that based on some prior knowledge, we have um, also a stochastic model and some observation X. We really want to infer the most likely distribution for our model parameters, given some data. So this is essentially coded in, in Bayes' theorem here. We were trying to determine the left-hand side here, which is the posterior. Um, we have the prior, the likelihood, and the evidence. And the, the standard way to do this these days is, is Bayesian inference um, or MCMC methods where you can approximate this likelihood in a certain way. The thing is for our like massive simulator where we put something in, we evolve things forward in time, we apply filters, there's really no easy way to write down this likelihood unless you make really strict um, or massive simplifications of what this likelihood function looks like. Um, so <clears throat> what we refer to um, this in this picture is essentially saying that this likelihood is pretty much intractable and it's really only implicitly defined in our simulator and it's really tough to write down an explicit form for this. So. We obviously didn't come up with this, but this kind of question is something that's been around for, for a long time um, and is addressed by these methods that we refer to as likelihood free inference or simulation based inference. People have moved away from the likelihood free a little bit because it does have a likelihood. The likelihood is just not known explicitly. So it's tough to write it down, but this doesn't mean that you don't have a likelihood. The likelihood is just encoded in this like little flowchart that I showed you earlier with these four boxes at the bottom. So it's just encoded in your simulator, and in principle, you can take advantage of this. Um, there's a really good review on this that we've we've dug through um, quite a few times that summarizes all the methods um, that have been around, and people have really like spearheaded, I'd say, in the last five six years. Now, how does this work? So essentially, we want to perform Bayesian inference for any kind of stochastic forward model. Um, specifically those that are specified in these complex simulators. And um, I have another flowchart that really outlines what's going on here. So I have some prior distributions. In the case of the magnetorotational um, evolution, the, those would be like the five parameters that control my um, individual PDFs. I sample from those. Um, I put that into my, my simulator. I run my simulator. I produce the output, which in this case is a PP dot diagram. I again represent that information in something that the neural network can work with. I only showed you one, but because we use three surveys in print, that's four, three surveys. <laughs> we only have three maps in this case. Um, the next step then is that we have to have some framework in place um, that essentially learns an association between the output of the simulator and what I've put in. Okay, so we want to learn this mapping essentially. And to do that, people have realized you can use. Um, any kind of like flexible um, density estimation framework. So specifically, um, people call this unconditional density estimator that essentially learns um, from the simulated data how to predict the input parameters. Okay, that's, that's the main goal of this. And once you've optimized your network on the training data that you have, 
you can use this conditional density estimator to find an approximate posterior by applying it to your empirical data set. Okay, so <clears throat> you hope that you start with something that's relatively wide and through this entire procedure, you ob obtain a relatively narrow posterior like you would also do for Bayesian inference. Okay, so there have been different approaches out there. And when we realized about a year and a half ago that this is what we wanna do, we started reading all these papers Lots of these come out of the computational neurosciences because they've really sort of like led this procedure and like driving um, this FBI framework with neural networks. Um, and we started like reading papers on algorithmic implementation. So there's basically three main um, approaches that people have used that focus on different pieces of Bayes' theorem. So there is algorithms that focus on actually estimating the posterior directly estimating the likelihood directly or um, calculating the, the whole right-hand side of base theorem minus the prior directly. So we have neural posterior estimation, neural likelihood estimation, and neural ratio estimation. Um, and the, the one that works the best for our specific problem, and it's also the one that people use very often, is this NPE approach, where you learn the posterior directly and it's specifically useful for most of the approaches that people use, because if you do these last two approaches and you wanna um, actually obtain your posterior, you essentially have to do another sampling step and sampling again takes time. So we've actually not been able to get these two to work for us because it just takes way too long. So this produces results for us um, on, a, on a day time scale, which is relatively quick for these kind of problems. And I'll show you some of the results in a bit. Um, I will skip this bit. But so how does how does this really work? How we did this in practice? Um, so we produced in total 360,000 synthetic population and it took six weeks because our entire simulator takes about an hour or two to run, which is relatively long. So if you wanna produce a reasonable number of training data, because this is also one of the issues that you always have with these frameworks, you, they, work the, they work better if you have more data. So um, we, we required quite a bit of data, but we have access to um, a high performance computing and a high throughput computing center. So we varied these five parameters for this specific study. So we fixed the, the dynamics because actually we couldn't vary more than five parameters for this specific problem. Um, and we produced these 360,000 synthetic population um, and produced PP dot maps for every one of these. And then we, produced, as I just said, these three maps again, which are essentially some of the statistics for the Newton's drives in this PV dot thing. Um, so we have 360,000 of these, but because we have actually three maps per uh, simulations, we have on the order of like a million images that we can work with. Now to do this actual inference, as I said earlier, we started reading about last year in, in, in April or May, a lot of papers on algorithms. And I was like saying, oh my God, how are we going to figure out how we're going to implement these? Because implementing one, if you know that this is the right one is okay. But actually like working through all what's in the literature is really tough. Um, and um, one of my PhD students attended a, a meeting um, on machine learning in Astro last summer. And um, someone who's coming from a computation neuroscience background gave a talk about a toolbox that they've written, which is called FBI. And um, it does all of these things for you. So I was very happy. <laughs> um, and we essentially like started using this once we had all our simulations at the beginning of this year. And within a relatively short amount of time, we already had some results and it was incredible how, how quickly it actually worked. And um, I'll get to in a second that once you have results, you still have to test all these things. So it does take quite a bit of time to like get this actually like to 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 work properly, but um, and we I met actually so I did my undergrad and masters in Tübingen and this group is currently based in Tübingen, and so I actually met with them last week and it was really incredible probably one of the most productive two hour meetings I've ever had because they have no idea about Astro, but they're really trying to like get people to use this toolbox and they're currently working on a tutorial paper, um that is also targeting people that have never done this before so we had obviously the advantage that we have done a bit of machine learning and deep learning before but it's really like an incredible like tool out there that people can really use if they want to do these kind of things 
even if you have your own me method of SBI, you might just want to like try and see what they've done just to sort of like cross check um, just what you get out. Um, but the way that we do this is we feed these three maps into our um, neural network that is composed of two main parts. So we first have a CNN very similar to the one I showed you earlier to compress this data into what we call a latent vector. So it essentially condenses the information into like a smaller space. And on that pres presentation, we then train this neural uh, density estimator. And there's a couple of options out there. We started with what's called the mixture density network, which is essentially you're trying to like model the shape of your posterior with a mixture of Gaussians. And what you're then trying to infer or optimize with your neural network is the, um, the means and the standard deviations of your Gaussians and also the relative coefficients. So how, how um, important are the individual Gaussian um, components? And we started with 10 because we thought naively maybe our posteriors are quite weird. Maybe we need a lot. It turns out we actually only need two. And last week, Jakob, uh, Jakob Macke, who wrote this toolbox, said, yeah, he would naively have just started with one. So this is something that we didn't know. But the more you have, the, the more difficult it's actually to train. But because eight of these coefficients are pretty much zero for us, it didn't really make that much of a difference how we actually train this. And there's, again, some, some machine learning information on that front. But it, it, it worked really surprisingly well. Um, so how do these posteriors look like? So um, we can, in principle, once we've trained this um, network, and for us, this takes between dependent on the setup and how easily we get access to our um, computing pipeline um, between about three hours and six, I would say. Sometimes it takes maybe eight, but that's a really bad choice of hyperparameters. Um, so once we've trained this on our training data set and validation um, set, we can essentially just apply any of our test samples onto the um, posterior um, calculation. And what you find is something that looks like this. So these are the five parameters that we're trying to infer. The blue dots are the ones that we put into the simulations. And you see we do actually recover them relatively well um, with this in entire framework. So for, for this specific test example, four of them are within the 95 credibility level. I think this one is just this one is just outside, but you do recover these parameters relatively well for this specific test sample. But obviously, um, I don't want to do this on any of our test samples, but on our actual true observed PP dot diagram. So this is something um, that we've been testing with different um, um, machine learning um, hyperparameters with different types of like architectures in the past couple of months um, to really test that what we're actually inferring is robust. Um, so the results that I'm showing you now are sort of like the average of the ones that we actually get by like trying different types of parameters for our network. And this is what this looks like. So the first two are the parameters for the magnetic field. The second two are the ones for um, the period distribution. And the last one is this alpha parameter would describe the late time evolution of the um, magnetic field at late times. And these are the 90, uh, 95 credibility intervals that we get for these parameters. And just to remind you, this is the functional form that we assume is correct. So obviously you always have to make that assumption that what you put in is right. But under that assumption that the model is correct, we get these relatively tight posteriors. Um, and this is something on the B front that they are much tighter than the P that people have actually seen before with the um, other kind of approaches as well. But we actually obtain like properly um, I don't think I put the plot in there, but we actually can show that these really like they're relatively well um uh, is it what I'm looking for. They do approximate our true posterior relatively well in this case. All right. Um with that, I'm just going to give you a quick summary and then people can go for lunch. I guess everyone is hungry. Um so mutant stars are compact remnants that emit pulsed radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum, which I showed you with this colorful PP dot diagram earlier. Um, the population that we've looked at specifically for this study, because it's the largest population that we have, is uh, standard isolated radio pulsars, where we have about uh, the order of a thousand. We hope we'll increase this by a factor of five to ten once we have SKA running and taking data. Um, we try and use this pulsar population synthesis fr framework that bridges this gap between the known objects and the actual massively underlying population that is out there 
to constrain the birth rates of our Newton star classes and their properties. And I hope I convinced you that deep learning is really useful um, to kind of analyze this high dimensional astrophysical data. And specifically, if you have these really complex simulators where it's really tough to write down a likelihood function that these um, FBI algorithms that are out there are actually very useful um, to really try and do the statistical inference approach that we, we, we very often want to solve. Um, and just a few, I think, four main points on the outlook front. So I just I did just highlight again that the, the functional form that we put in, obviously, that's an assumption. And we have to trust other people that they have done their analyses correct in principle to like, say that this is the, what observed um, is actually like correct. Um, and we're currently trying to figure out how we can actually explore different assumptions on the initial period and magnetic field distribution and maybe seeing which one fits better. Um, we also want to extend this framework to gamma rays and x-rays and really predict the multi-wavelength emission of these sources um, because they, the, the underlying population is the same, but you observe it from a different angle, essentially. So you, by observing in different wavelengths, you can really try and break degeneracies in the parameters that you see. The main problem is that currently we have a significantly smaller number of objects in those classes. So we only know about 20 to 30 magnetars, and X-ray emission is really tough to model. So we're currently trying to figure out how to really do that. There's a few more, I mean, there's a couple of hundred sources in the gamma ray, so this is probably what we're going to do first, just to sort of start with something a bit easier. Um, but that's like what we're trying to like work on on the physics side. Um, and then in the FBI side, I said, we've mainly used um, the NPE approach, and we might want to have another go and see if we change the SBI framework just to see if that actually would give us different results. But what we've seen so far is really like encouraging. Um, and then one of the things that you might have, uh, that you might want to ask yourself from what I said earlier when, we, when I said we simulated 360,000 of these simulations and it took six weeks, the more physics you add, so if you want to do this, the more free parameters you have. So if you want to really like spread out simulations for your parameter space, this scales really, really, really badly. And our simulator right now takes about an hour to two. If you put in more physics, it will also take longer to run. So there is actually ways, instead of like doing this like full spread of the parameter space, you sort of like provide um, maybe let's say a hundred simulation. And then in your loop for your SBI approach that I showed you earlier, there is actually, oh, I said the flowchart of SBI, which wasn't a loop, you can actually turn this into a loop that you provide information from your inferred posterior and you sample from that again and you don't just like spread the whole prior that you have, but you let like your system be optimized for a smaller number of parameters and you sample from that posterior. And then you produce more simulations in that parameter space. So essentially let your network learn an active way in which direction you need to provide more information to. Um, so that's something that we mainly spoke to the people last week about because we've just realized like our approach right now that we're doing is not really scalable if we want to actually do more physics. Who are trying to um, figure out how to do this, what's called sequential neural posterior estimation. Um, and yes, I think that's it. And if you have any questions, please let me know. So I guess we've got time for a couple of questions. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Can you go back to your results slide, please? Yes. Can you give me? Just wanted to check that I understand yeah. that correctly. So the mu v means that you, if you assume that the first magnetic field by uh, this piece of emission stars is a Gaussian, the mean magnetic field is a certain Gauss. So these are the means of the log. So it's the mean of the, the, the log, but yeah, okay. that's close to that if you take yeah. the, the, the temp to yeah, that. So that's what it should mean. That's what it is in yes. the period. What do you mean to that? Um, so that would be 10 to the minus 9, which I think is 0 0.1 or something like 0 0.2 seconds. So the mean of the log is at that value. And if you convert that to the actual distribution, you would have something. Uh, do we have a uh, In seconds. So that's, yes. that's, so that's the, this 0 0.1 is, seconds. Yeah, it would sit approximately here. Uh, so this is the birth again. And then they basically start here higher up. And they start somewhere up here. And then they move further down that way. Okay. Um, and that is assuming that this, this is a, a Gaussian distribution or log normal distribution. Yeah. So is there is there any um, time 
if you have credibility in DevOps, depends on the assumption that this is the cost. Yeah. Is there, is there any way to say that gives something like a chi square? I'm not doing data science, mm -hmm. uh, but so, like a chi square. So this is chi squared 1.1. 1 .1, so really good thing, or we have chi squared 3. So this is. Yeah. So I mean, basically, like we're not trying to like um, calculate any like kind of like um, like classical statistical uh, metrics because we essentially like looking at our credibility intervals, right? So that's essentially like encoding how well we're approximating um, the, the parameter range that is most likely for our system. Now, if you're asking where these are coming from, we we assume that the, um, the distribution um, accurately represents the current population that we have. And we're essentially assuming that this is the case because of other previous populations and the studies that are out there. Now, you see already that th these posteriors are much wider. And this is something that people have really said in the past. You kind of lose information as you move in this PP dot plane about what's happening at birth. So the functional form here is a lot more difficult to constrain. And in principle, what we want to figure out how to do is the equivalence of Bayesian model comparison, but with SBI, because in Bayesian model comp comparison, you can essentially like try just try and say, um, you can find a metric of like figuring out which model is more likely given your data. I do not know how to do that with SBI because in principle, you can't really write this down in the exact same way. So um, I've asked this question last week and um, they didn't really have an answer that this is something that we try and actually have to do properly to really figure out what's the right functional form for these kind of things. What, what about trying another one, let's say in power laws? Yeah, so the thing is, yes, then you can produce posteriors, but um so we didn't run we, we tried this for like a few of the runs so we didn't use a log um we didn't use an, uh, a normal distribution and log we just used um uh, a gaussian in the actual period and under that assumption you don't get something that's massively different to this so it would still fit the data to some extent in the period plane it doesn't work for these because they're much more narrow um so we really cannot say very well what that specific functional form looks like at this point. Um, but I have the hope that once we have more data and you fill out the space a lot more and you have more samples, you really can do that much better than what we can right now. Any other quick questions? Rob? Hi. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the expected total number of multiples on the value. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Could you tell me a bit more about how that number is? Okay, so it's, it's like the, the, the worst estimate that you could probably do as an astronomer. <laughs> I literally assume that Newton stars are born at a constant birth rate. So basically from the time the galaxy exists, I have exactly the same core collapse supernova rate through the whole age of the universe. Okay, uh, sorry, the whole age of the galaxy, okay? That's already like a massive um, simplification. That's unlikely the case. Um, this number, I, I guess we're not going to debate. We assume that we know relatively well how old the, the galaxy is. Um, now, this number comes from like a number of observational things. So um, there is obviously like a way to like count the number of massive stars that we see um, around us as, an, as well as in other galaxies. So people have sort of like tried to like um, extrapolate back from the number of massive stars that we see um, and under the assumption that we think we understand the collapse process uh, relatively well and how many supernova we see, people have estimated that. Um, and it sort of gives you something on the order of one to, to three on average. Um, there is, I think, a slightly better way um, or like a more robust way to like get this number, which is people have tried to um, extract, um, no, let me go the other way around. During the core collapse supernova process, you produce a specific uh, aluminium. Maybe someone in the audience knows this better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> aluminium 26. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, um, that um, emits, if I understand this right, in the gamma rays. So from the kind of emission that you see in the gamma rays, you can then kind of like link back to how much aluminium you must have produced. Um, and then you can also get an estimate on how many core collapse supernova you actually need to produce. To, to match that in principle. So I think whenever I talk to people that try um, and match this number, they get a bit of a, 
a stomach ache. I think this is pretty much impossible to like up the, the cocoa supernova rate to something that is on the order of 10. And keep in mind, this also makes black holes to some extent, right? So mm -hmm. that makes it even less less uh, easy to really accommodate the number of neutron stars. I imagine the cocoa is meant to trace it down to the history of the not yeah. Yeah. So I guess you could. So in our like um, in our simulation framework, what we do do is we make neutron stars at a at a um, at a constant birth rate. So we do sample those ages. What I should also say is that neutron stars that are older, let me just think, than a few times ten to the seven years, are actually no longer observable because. So I, this is a snapshot of the current time, but what stars are actually going to do is they're going to move this way as you make them older and older. And we, you, you see there's sort of like an imaginary line where there is nothing underneath. And there is this thing that essentially what happens is as their magnetic field decays and they slow down, they um, have much lower uh, rotational energy reservoirs as they age. So they're just becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. So in principle, just from like that energy argument, they the stars that are older than like a few times, I mean, a star that's 10 to the eight years, you already have no chance of observing anymore. So in principle, the stars that are born at the very early age of or early evolutionary stages of my galaxy, I, I don't really care about so much what's happening to them. So we just like sample from those, or we just have that prescription so we can basically start at something that's realistic from birth. But in principle, I could also start at like 10 to the eight. So the first, Fractions doesn't matter.